Okay. Um, and then I'm going to give no control. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. This is Jeanette Gass from IASP, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. Today's webinar is one in a series related to the 2020 Global Year for the Prevention of Pain. Uh, before I introduce our first speaker, I wanted to let you know that you can participate in the webinar today by asking questions in the Q&A session um, in the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel window, or you can ask questions in the chat, um, and you can tweet using hashtag Global Year 2020 and follow IASP on Twitter. Um, now I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Dr. Yonis. Yonis is professor in Brussels, Belgium, and physiotherapist at the University Hospital of Brussels. He holds the chair of oncological physiotherapy and is a visiting professor at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. He runs the Pain in Motion International Research Group, and the primary aim of his research is improving care for patients with pain. Thank you. So here are some details regarding tweeting and the Q&A session that will follow the lectures. So the first lecture is, uh, is dedicated to education and communication strategies that we can use in patients having uh, pain. But please be aware that those communication and educational strategies are aiming at improving self-management in our patients. So that's very key to the understanding. So education is not a goal in itself, but improving self-management of our patients, that's the key idea. And I'm doing this on behalf of the people from the Pain in Motion group that you see on the slide, at least the ones who are affiliated to our university in Brussels. You're probably aware of the concept of pain neuroscience education, where we try to change pain beliefs in our patients through reconceptualizing pain. And this is not an aim in itself, but the aim is, of course, teaching them more adaptive pain coping strategies. And what's also key in this respect is that it uh, is supposed to lead to improved pain beliefs and pain behavior. And this has been shown in a series of studies uh, uh, that are available out there in a variety of chronic pain patients. However, in general, the effect sizes are small to medium at best, so there is room for improvement. And one idea to further improve this strategy is to combine it with motivational interviewing. And that's an idea that we came up with together with uh, a number of colleagues. And this slide is adapted to the COVID pandemic because of course it's unfortunate that we cannot organize this, uh, this type of events in live settings and that we're not able to meet one another and chat about it. Uh, following the lecture in, in real life. And it can take some time, of course, before we can meet one another in person because of the COVID pandemic. And this is what I will be looking like uh, in a couple of years from this way you will be able to recognize me. We have to confess, of course, that the origin of motivational interviewing is not from the pain field, but it's taken from the uh, field of drug and alcohol abuse. And uh, of course, I also have to uh, confess that it wasn't only me uh, taking on this idea, but also the people that uh, are listed on the slide. But unfortunately, my slide is away now. I don't know what has happened. Perhaps I can switch back now. Janet, can you I'm help? fixing it. Hold on just one second. <laughs> Okay. 
Sorry, everyone, it's not letting me share. Jeanette, is it worth us trying to share from our own screens? Um, you can if you would like. Um, let me see if this will share. Ah, there we go. There we go. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> okay, so uh, I was saying that uh, the integration of paleo science education with. Okay. So Let's start again. So, you might not be able to control it. Sorry, Janet, you were saying? You might not be able to change your slides right now. I might I have to do not. that. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. So integration of pain research education with motivational interviewing was uh, an idea that we developed together with people from various countries, including Paul, Joss, Megan, Adrian, from the, the US, uh, Adrian, of course, is also from South Africa, Amarance, Rob, Marielle, Paul uh, from the Netherlands, Wacht, Eva, Walter, and Belgium. So those are the people who co-developed this uh, together with me. Okay, next slide, please. And, yeah, again, click, please. And of course, the integrated approach is uh, dedicated to get the best of the two worlds with motivational interviewing, targeting change talk. For those unfamiliar with change talk, it first implies that you recognize in what the patients tell you whether or not they are keen to change their behavior towards managing their pain problem. In general, therapeutic alliance is very central to the motivational interviewing approach and should, probably should be central to any self-management approach. And what's also very nice about motivational interviewing is that it uh, changes its way of communicating with our patients in line with the stage of behavioral change where the patient in is right now. Motivational interview, interviewing has been studied in a series of studies in a variety of chronic pain patients as well, similar to pain or sand education, and in general we see very consistent improvements in terms of treatment and the adherence when this approach is used also uh, together with other interventions towards developing a more multimodal approach. The reference that you see in the right lower uh, corner of the slide, that's the reference to the practical guide which is available uh, for integrating both approaches into our management for people having pain. And the practical guide includes a script, a script that clinicians can use uh, to facilitate their own uh, practice to apply this in, in their practice. The script of score, of course, is in English uh, and we have translated it into languages. Okay, next slide, please. Motivational interviewing typically uses uh, open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries as illustrated in this next uh, sentence. Next. Yes, thank you. Well, these and other uh, sentences and examples that I will be presenting in this uh, uh, lecture are taken from the script that I mentioned, and so you can all consult them in the, uh, the practical guide available in Physical Therapy Journal. And as you can see, uh, this is an example. Uh, the, we use an open-ended question at the end. We use affirmations, we reflect on the patient's situation, expressing a lot of empathy, and we summarize the patient's situation. Next slide, please. Eliciting change talk can be done, for instance, through uh, this particular example, where in the first uh, part, okay, next slide, please, um, where we where the part which is now um, expressed in, in, in red 
that's the part where we reflect on the previous initial part on paying your assigned education. And in the second part, uh, in the lower part of, the, of the, the slide, you see the text which is then making sure that the patient will reflect on the current way of managing their pain problem. So that's the real motivational interviewing below there. Next slide, please. Like said, motivation interviewing changes or adapts to the stage of behavioral change where the patient in is right now. For patients who are far away from changing their behavior uh, when they are in the pre-contemplation stage, you can use this type of communication as uh, presented on the slide as an example of how we can communicate with our patients. And the main message here, the main idea here is not to make these patients feel bad about their current way of uh, approaching their pain problem, but rather expressing empathy, making sure that they feel relaxed and that all doors are keeping open. Next slide, please. So we move on to the next phase of behavioral change, the contemplation stage, where you see in this particular example in red, again, reflecting on the previous pain neuroscience education part, blue part, blue part connecting nicely the pain neuroscience education with, uh, with motivational interviewing. And then the last sentence on this slide, the one which is displayed in black. That's where we are providing options to our patients to take action to change their behavior. But again, we're not telling them that they should change their behavior, but we provide options for them to consider. And we make sure that the patients feel safe that they are the ones making the final decision of changing or not changing their behavior. Next slide, please. When a patient is close towards changing their behavior towards a more adaptive way of coping with pain, you can consider introducing concepts that will further facilitate social support. You may be aware that social support is a major predictor of uh, uh, long-term chronicity, so it can facilitate, facilitate prevention of pain and chronicity in patients suffering from pain. So this is an example of how you can integrate strategies that will facilitate social support in our patients. Next slide, please. You may wonder why should we um, learn a, 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 a rather complex communication strategy like motivational interviewing when uh, pain neuroscience education in itself is a rather complex uh, on its own? Well, one of the main reasons is to approach the more complex patients with chronic pain, for instance. And these include the subgroup of the chronic pain patient population that obviously presents perceived injustice because those presenting perceived injustice, they are uh, often the most difficult patients to handle. Next slide, please. For those unfamiliar with perceived injustice, it relates to the feeling of anger, frustration, the lack of accepting their pain problem, often seen in patients following a tra uh, with pain following a traffic act uh, accident or patients who have gone through unsuccessful surgery or uh, in the lower part of the slide illustrated, uh, so press on the next slide, please those who never smoked yet were diagnosed with lung cancer. That's also a typical example of those expressing perceived injustice. Uh, next slide, please. Those uh, with perceived injustice, they express typically more pain behavior, and this, this in itself triggers a different way of approaching those patients by in healthcare practitioners, including physicians who tend to prescribe more severe analgesics like opioids to patients who have perceived injustice. So targeting perceived injustice may also be uh, a way of uh, addressing uh, and contributing to diminishing the opioid pandemic. Next slide, please. And therefore we propose that addressing patients with chronic pain and perceived injustice may include a comprehensive approach for, uh, 
which includes not only explaining pain, but also the integrated approach with motivational interviewing to hopefully make them accept their chronic pain problem better and uh, switching their attention towards pursuing life goals and restarting valued occupations. Next slide, please. I want to end with a quote from Romy Parker, uh, which she shared with us in preparation of this webinar, because I think it summarizes what I was uh, talking about, and it also nicely sets the scene for the next lectures uh, included in this webinar. Next slide, please. And I mentioned that the practical guide for integrating motivational interviewing with pain neuroscience education includes a script to aid clinicians in applying this in clinical practice. And I mentioned that the English uh, language script is available in the physical therapy paper that I mentioned. But I also mentioned that we translated it already in uh, Dutch, in uh, Spanish, and also in Italian. But we are waiting for the uh, Oxford Press, which is the, the company that uh, publishes Physical Therapy Journal, to, to grant us the permission to spread these other language uh, scripts for free on our website. Uh, next slide, please, in the Tools for Clinical Practice section on our website, where you can already ex uh, access for free uh, a number of tools, including tools for clinical practice uh, for uh, providing pain neuroscience education to patients uh, in eight to nine different languages. Thank you for your attention. Okay, our next presenter is JP Canero. He is, I'm sorry, um, let's see. He is a specialist sports physical therapist, physiotherapist titled Pain Physiotherapist and has a PhD in musculoskeletal physiotherapy uh, at Curtin University. JP is a research fellow, part of the Center of Research Excellence in Hip and Knee Osteoarthritis and a multi-center trial testing for cognitive functional therapy for disabling back pain. He also lectures in the Master of Clinical Physiotherapy, and he focuses on the management of complex musculoskeletal pain in his clinical practice. Cool. Am I ready to go, Janet? Yeah, ready to go. Cool. So good evening, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having us and joining us in this uh, lovely initiative that I asked is uh, putting together. Um, so I think this will be a nice segue from your presentation. And sorry, next slide, please. So one of the things that we know, and you can click again, um, is that in traumatic injuries, such as in a ACL tear, uh, there is growing evidence uh, that you can prevent these injuries through uh, exercise based program. Next slide. Uh, Kay Crosley's group just presented today, uh, uh, just uh, published today, uh, a large systematic review at, uh, on BJSM talking specifically about this. So if you get people going through an exercise-based program, uh, female soccer players, you can reduce injury by 22% overall musculoskeletal injuries uh, and up to 45% on ACL injuries. However, next slide there is little evidence for prevention of pain, specifically for pain that persists uh, over a prolonged period of time, which is commonly um, uh, named as chronic pain or persistent pain. Next slide. So if we focus mainly on the, the main musculoskeletal pain conditions, such as back pain, osteoarthritis, neck pain, one of the things that we know, next, is that they are commonly associated with comorbid health problems. Next and they share risk factors that are a threat to healthy aging. And so they are, so if you look at the risk factors for pain and for other health issues, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, they share very similar risk factors, which tells us that when we are dealing with people um, with persistent pain, uh, we have to take a broader approach, a health approach. Uh, next, please. And what we know is that pain is very common and is recurrent. So uh, most of us, or 
I would say all of us would experience some form of pain throughout our lives. And next. And one of the things that we know is that the triggers for, for pain flares, they vary across the biopsychosocial spectrum. And sorry, if we go back, thank you. Um, if you look at the, uh, at the context in which people develop pain flare-ups, it's often when they are feeling run down, when they're stressed out, when they're not sleeping well, when they're not doing much physical activity or they're doing physical activity that they are not fit for. Um, and they are common um, contributors for someone to develop a pain flare-up. Next one. So if we, in a very simplistic manner, try to summarize how pain can occur, you can have someone that is doing really well, and we know that factors across the biopsychosocial spectrum uh, will um, determine this person's health. And we have a buffer zone, which is our homeostasis. And across time, if you hit uh, next a couple of times, this interplay between the bio, the cycle, and the social elements, they will vary across time. And when that combination, or when that interplay hits a tipping point, next, we can have pain emerging as an expression of our health system, of a person's health. So basically what we're trying to say here is that uh, there's lots of factors that can contribute to someone having pain. And as you uh, said very well, you know, a key idea is to get people to conceptualize pain in a broader biopsychosocial perspective. And this may enable them to understand that when pain flares occur, uh, they are not always linked to tissue damage, especially when pain persists. Um, next one. So looking at the evidence around exercise and prevention, we know that exercise therapy, specific targeted exercises, and physical activity, next, uh, they can treat up to 26 chronic conditions and they can provide prevention to 35 chronic conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, and etc. Now the key problem is, next, how do we get people to actually exercise? So that's a great photo in my, in my view in terms of behavior change. You know, these guys are going to the gym to lift some weights, but they decide to take the escalator. So changing behavior is not easy. Next one. And one of the key things to be able to, to change behavior is to understand um, about the condition or to understand how one can become, uh, find themselves in a, in a position of pain. And there's some lovely work in the qualitative space uh, around the back, the knee and the hip that provides us with a, with a good way of understanding how patients understand these conditions. So if you hit next a couple of times. So when you ask patients about, you know, what is this pain? The, the idea that they are damaged, you know, the, there is a structure that is problematic is very common. Uh, when you question them about the causes, it's usually link, linked to using the body, you know, lifting, running, or the simple fact that you're getting old. So this idea that there's nothing you can do and your body is vulnerable. And as you use it, you will cause more damage and that protection is necessary. A common consequence of that, next, will be that people will start avoiding activity and they will feel like they're not able to exercise, next. And the only way of managing that is actually by fixing the structure. You know, and in some cases, such as in knee osteoarthritis, surgery may be, is, may be seen as the only option. Next one. So actually changing a person's belief uh, may be a key driver to changing behavior. But as you're presented, you know, you can get someone and say, look, you need to be less pure and just get active. Uh, or you can question them. Next, uh, saying, what do you think you could do to get active? And next, so this idea of reflective questioning can be quite powerful because we tend, next, we tend to find, uh, we're more easily convinced by things that we find ourselves. So if it's a solution that you come up with, you're more likely to adhere to that, to that decision. Next one. And the same goes to uh, when we are examining patients. Um, you can, there's some evidence to say that explaining something to someone may not be sufficient to change uh, their behavior. You may change their beliefs, but their behavior may be different. Uh, and that is why it's what is so important for us to expose that person 
to the very task that they're fearful of because they may have heard from you that bending is safe and they may say to you that it's safe to bend but when they actually bend forward they bend their trunk and not their back because implicitly they are thinking about some of these danger messages so next one please so education sometimes is not enough to change behavior and creating an environment where the person gets a new experience may be necessary. Next. And one way of doing that is through um, what well, one of the key aspects of, of, um, of getting there is to understand the person's con context. And as you can see, there are lots of factors that can determine a person's context. And next one. So this is where they currently are and you want to know where they want to go so understanding the person's goals is not only understanding the things that they want to to achieve but also the demands of their lifestyle you know how many kids they've got do they care for elderly parents uh do they have access to exercise do they enjoy exercising uh do they you know are they a firefighter and therefore their work requires is very physically demanding and you want to understand when pain occurs what is the impact that that has on their day-to-day -day life. Next one. So the very first thing we want to do is actually, you can hit next a couple of times, Jeanette, thank you. So it's actually getting people, we wanna observe them doing the very things that they are frightened of doing, or if they are in a pain state that they feel pain to do, or they, they, they are avoiding to do uh, in case they get a flare up. And next one. So if we get, for instance, bending as a, as a task towards lifting someone's child, so you target that value task and you, the questions you want to ask is, you know, how do you do this? How do you bend to pick up your child? Are you aware of how you do this? And why do you do it? Is this something that you're trying to achieve? Is this a, a, an automatic habit? Or you've been told to do it this way because it's safer for you. Then you may expose that person in doing that task in a, in a different way. And that may be putting more weight on a leg, they're avoiding putting weight on, it may be making them relax, it may be making them uh, adopt a stronger position. And you question them about the expectation of the outcome of that particular task. And then you ask them about their experience. You know, which one was best, your old way or your new way? And when we do that, we create uh, uh, an immediate relationship between a habit, between something that they value and the way they do it, a connection between their beliefs and their body. Next one. So these behavior experiments uh, that induce behavioral learning, they can facilitate a mindset change because it's through a felt experience that they may be able to control um, what they're feeling directly linked to the habits uh, that they, they are exposed to on day to day. Next one. So integration, in, oh sorry, integrating these new habits to daily life is key. And the way we may do that, and if we think about exercise, exercise can be seen as the actual repetition of the new habit. So if you have trouble putting on your shoes, every time you put on your shoes, you gotta adopt a new strategy. Uh, I've got a lady at the minute that has been doing really well. She used to avoid one leg. Uh, she was very deconditioned, very frightened. She became stronger. She, she can stand on that leg. She can exercise on the leg. She can go upstairs. And when I questioned her, is there anything else you're avoiding? And she said, no, there isn't. But when I questioned her a little bit more, she said, well, actually, I don't pick up my granddaughter as much as I used to. I said, why don't you do that? She goes, well, I don't want to be silly. I don't want to have a flare up. Well, little to say that for the rem remaining of that session, we did a lot of bending over and picking up some dumbbells that looked nothing like her granddaughter, but at least resembled the weight of her granddaughter. And we did that so many times that by the end of it, she goes, well, I guess I can pick her up. So actually getting that repetition and using, so something that she was avoiding before is now used as an exercise to condition her to do the very thing that she values. Next one. Or you can also use targeted exercises as a mechanism to condition a new habit. So someone needs to relax when they bend, bend over, but they can't do it. So they need to engage in some exercises to learn how to relax. Or they are frightened of bending their knees and their hips and you get them in positions that they do that. Or they need to rehab some specific exercises such as conditioning your calf 
to be able to go up the stairs in a more um, uh, springy way. So when we think of exercise, we can think of habits that they apply on a daily basis, and we can think of um, structured exercises to build up the capacity for them to adopt a new habit. So you can hit uh, three times for me, please. So you, our job is to promote these strategies that help people to engage confidently in daily tasks. So my job is not just to make them be able to do 30 squats if squats has nothing to do with their problem. Um, and build self-efficacy so they feel empowered to meet the demands of their work and their sport. And also using flare-ups as a learning opportunity. So some of those negative mindsets that you uh, spoke about and, and I spoke about at the beginning, you know, these unhelpful beliefs, they may resurge when you have a flare-up. And with those beliefs, these habits may come up as well. So when they have a flare-up and they come in or they communicate with you by email, actually using that as an opportunity to challenge those beliefs again. Next one. So overall, to empower someone to better health, we need to help them build a positive mindset about pain, you know, to understand that there is more to pain and tissue damage, to coach them to develop confidence, to exercise or be active, doing things of their preference, doing things that they have access and that is linked to their values and goals. For some people, uh, encouraging healthy lifestyle, and you may need to work with a um, behavioral psychologist to uh, help people to break habits in terms of their of their diets or a dietitian. Uh, you may create routines for optimization of sleep. Um, but also, again, talking about flare-ups. The next one, please. You know, creating reassurance at a time where patients have flare-ups. To say, for instance, this lady, you know, you are doing well and you're going now to go and pick up your granddaughter. In a few weeks, you may have an experience of pain again. Now, do not freak out. That is common, that is normal. What are you gonna do if that happens? And then you take them through a routine where they actually can, um, uh, they can enact uh, how they would behave if they had a flare up. Now, when that person comes in, if they become avoidant of using a, a knee, for instance, actually getting them active in the session is really important. So you're not just telling them to, be, uh, to feel safe, but you're actually engaging them in an active behavior to demonstrate that it's safe to use their body. Next one. So finally, I would like to say that uh, when we talk about exercise and prevention, perhaps the focus when we are talking about patients with persistent pain is that we are trying to reconceptualize pain as a modifiable symptom, something that happens and it's common and will happen again. And what we're trying to do is to minimize the impact when pain actually occurs. Next one. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Jeanette. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank you for that presentation. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Romy Parker. She is a physiotherapist and associate professor in the Department of Anesthesia and Perioperative Medicine at the University of Cape Town, where she leads the pain management unit. She is an active member of the chronic pain management interdisciplinary team at the Grootscher Hospital, where she facilitates a six-week chronic pain management program, the Pain Education Empowerment Program, or PEEP. Much of the research um, her, that she has done is explore the effects of PEEP, as well as similar programs in other uh, areas, such as living with osteoarthritis and positive living for people with HIV and chronic pain. Romy, ready to go? Thanks so much, Jeanette. Um, thanks for joining us, everyone. It's very exciting to see you all clocking in from around the world. Um, so I'm going to be talking briefly on, on mindfulness-based strategies, and I want you to be thinking about these as active treatments for preventing and managing pain. Um, sometimes in society, mindfulness is regarded as, as a passive treatment approach, but it requires an active decision of engagement. And so it's really helpful that Yo has already talked to us about stages of change, um, because if somebody is pre-contemplative, there's no way that they're going to start exercising um, or adopting mindfulness practices. Um, so next slide, please, Jeanette. 
um, just to, to make a declaration that as a physical therapist or physiotherapist, as we call ourselves here, that um, I do have a potential conflict of interest in this presentation because the non-pharmacological treatments are the bedrock of my profession. So my presentation is bound to be biased. Um, I'll keep an eye on that, but I just need to say that up front. Next, Jeanette. So time is short. I'm just going to tell you what I'm going to cover briefly. We're going to touch base on what we mean by mindful practices. Um, and then I'm briefly going to present some of the evidence for their impact on pain um, to ensure that we are being evidence-based in our healthcare practice. And then going to present to you a way of thinking about the mechanisms of action for mindfulness on pain and talk about how we can consider implementing mindfulness practices um, into our daily practice with our patients. Next. So there are many definitions for the term mindfulness, um, but this is one that I really like. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn has written very widely and is the founder of the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program. And he's defined mindfulness as paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. Practicing mindfulness takes a decision, it takes commitment, and it takes paying attention to your cognitions. It takes thinking about your thinking in order to be non-judgmental. Next. And I'm sure many of you have seen these sort of cartoons and drawings um, illustrating for us the difference between having a full mind, which I think in the era of COVID is what my brain feels like about 99% of the time, endlessly ruminating about the what ifs and maybes and if that, um, and being mindful, being conscious of the present moment in a non-judgmental way. Notice how the little girl isn't thinking that the flowers are particularly beautiful or that it's a wonderful day. It's just observing that the sun is shining and that the flowers are present. I think one of my favorite um, reminders of what it means to be mindful is the saying of, when you wash the dishes, wash the dishes. How many of you, when you wash the dishes, have an argument with somebody in your head, solve all the problems of the world, do a dozen other things? It's to be mindful is to be present in the moment. Next slide. So there are lots of different ways of being mindful. You can be mindful on a daily basis and being present when you're washing the dishes. There's mindfulness meditation and diaphragmatic breathing can be mindful practice. There's body scans. There's mindful reading, writing, listening, eating, walking. The guided imagery uh, task for mindfulness. Uh, the dropping anchor exercises, which we often use when people are struggling with anxiety of notice five things that you can touch and five sounds and five sights and five smells and five tastes. Those are all mindfulness practices. And then we have full mindfulness curricula like the mindfulness-based stress reduction programs. Next slide. What all of these mindfulness practices have in common is the non-judgmental observance of the current moment. They are all involve mental training, but not mental training in isolation, because all mindfulness practices acknowledge that as human beings we're embodied. And so we're talking about a mind-body skill here, which is why it falls completely within the scope of physiotherapy. And what we're aiming for when we are developing the mind-body skill of mindfulness practice is that we overflow from individual practice to living to a mindful way of being. Next slide. So if that's mindfulness, is this evidence-based healthcare? What's the evidence for using mindfulness to prevent pain and to manage pain? Well, some of, one of the earliest uh, papers, which is really useful to look at, um, was this paper from kabat and, and colleagues, where they, in a small clinical trial, took a group of people who were having treatment for psoriasis, um, and they were entering into the ultraviolet light therapy blue booths on a regular basis. Um, and half these patients, when they went into the ultraviolet booth, would listen to a mindfulness-guided imagery recording. 
the other half of patients got to listen to the music of their choice. I know I would probably go for the music of my choice. The sad thing is that if I had made the opposite decision and listened to the guided mindfulness practice, I would have had a four-fold faster recovery of my psoriasis. Now, this study is really critical because it brought to the forefront of evidence the understanding that mindfulness is not just a nice thing to do, but it has multiple physiological benefits to improve health. Next slide. And the number of studies that have been published over the years over mindfulness have increased to the point where there were over a thousand papers in 2014. So what about the evidence for mindfulness and pain? People who practice mindfulness regularly, when they come into the laboratory um, and we do experimental acute pain studies with them, um, they're very brave. Uh, so they come into the lab and we may uh, induce pain using thermal or pressure stimuli. People who practice mindfulness regularly have a greater pain tolerance, they have an increased pain threshold, and they report reduced pain unpleasantness. And I just want to point out that they're not actually practicing mindfulness meditation at the time of the experiment. They are simply regular mindfulness practitioners. If we look at people with chronic pain, well, a whole range of different mindfulness practices have been shown to be effective to reduce both the severity of the pain, but also the functional impact of chronic pain. And the impact of these um, interventions, mindfulness interventions, lasts for up to three years, which is pretty significant in terms of long-term effects of the treatment. If we compare mindfulness interventions for pain to cognitive behavioral therapy, um, to exercise interventions and, and other behavior strategies for pain, they have similar small to moderate effects that are equivalent. So this is certainly a tool to be added to our armamentarium. Next slide, please. So if we look overall at the evidence to support mindfulness for the management of pain, they are a valid treatment option for both the prevention and the management of pain. So we have to keep in mind that while JP's told us some many good reasons why we should be exercising, not everybody wants to exercise. And if we're working in a patient-centered practice where we are developing therapeutic relationships with our patients, then mindfulness approaches should be offered to patients as one of the treatment options that they may wish to pursue. And I just want to add here that brief interventions are effective too, because many patients, when you suggest mindfulness to you, to them, have this idea that they need to meditate for an hour every day, and that's just not going to happen. However, the evidence is that short interventions, brief sessions of mindfulness practice are effective in reducing pain and reducing chronic pain. Next slide. So I want to take you through this because I find it a useful model to think about how the different treatment strategies that we have may impact on somebody's pain. So in every person with pain, we need to be considering the brain because pain is a conscious construct of the brain in response to a perception of threat. But we're not just interested in the brain. We also need to think about what's going on in the peripheral nervous system. From the peripheral nervous system, what's going on in the spinal cord, what up and down interactions are taking place between the spinal cord and the brain. And we need to consider the other systems, like the immune system and the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system, which all are going to influence the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system and influence our experience of pain. So if we look at how mindfulness influences all of these multiple systems, next click please. Oh, back one. If we look at the peripheral nervous system first, we know that people who practice mindfulness regularly have modulated inflammatory responses when they have acute injuries. 
What I mean by modulated is that it's not that they have a reduced inflammatory response, but their balance between pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines is modulated. So they have a good pro-inflammatory response, and then they have a good anti-inflammatory response so that they follow through that tissue healing process in the way that we would expect in a healthy system. Next click. If we look at the spinal cord in people who practice mindfulness regularly, people who are mindfulness practitioners seem to have more efficient descending inhibitory mechanisms. So when we do conditioned pain modulation studies with them, they seem to have really good downward inhibitory mechanisms from the brain to the spinal cord, which may assist with reducing spinal cord sensitization processes. Next one, please. And if we look at the brain, in people who practice mindfulness regularly, they have increased activation in the anterior cingulate cortex and in the right anterior insula and reduced thalamic activation. And these changes are associated with reduced pain. We also know that regular mindfulness practitioners show changes in the prefrontal cortex, in the hippocampus, and the amygdala. And these changes are associated with emotion regulation and are important in extinction and reconsolidation of memories, critical components in the reduction and development of chronic pain. And what about the other systems? Next click, please. The immune system, people who practice mindfulness regularly have reductions in pro-inflammatory cytokines and increased CD4 counts. The autonomic nervous system, well, regular mindful pra mindfulness practice, we see phasic and tonic stimulation of the vagal nerve. And so again, we see modulation between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system so that we are able to respond appropriately to stresses or threats and then to restore homeostasis to keep us in that zone, which JP pointed out to us so nicely. In the endocrine system, people who practice mindfulness regularly have modulation of the HPA axis and the RAA systems with all the benefits that those entail. So you can see how mindfulness has benefits on multiple levels and is not just a nice thing to do. Next slide, please. So if we've got evidence that mindfulness is effective, and if we look at the multiple levels at which mindfulness has the potential to either prevent pain or to address pain, then it's certainly a tool that we as physiotherapists should consider integrating into our practice. And the question is, how do we do that? Because behavior change is never easy for our patients or for ourselves. So first of all, you need to develop your own skills in mindfulness, and a simple Google search will lead you to a thousand different options to develop those skills. Then if you want to think about integrating this into your practice with patients, you need to develop a curriculum to facilitate skills acquisition by your patient. Just as JP was illustrating to us that we don't want to be lecturing people and telling them what to do, we need to develop a scaffolded approach, a hands-on demonstration, to facilitate their skills acquisition where we're hands off and they acquire the skills of mindfulness. Ultimately, we want to increase our patient's self-efficacy so that they shift from knowing just about mindfulness to being mindful. And if your patient doesn't choose mindfulness as a treatment option, don't worry, just integrate those principles into the treatments that they do choose. Next slide. You want to be mindful, whether you're exercising, or doing any other of the multiple treatments that we use as physiotherapists. Pay attention, be present, and adopt a non-judgmental attitude of curiosity. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Our last presenter is Dr. Ann Soderlin. She is a professor in physiotherapy with behavioral medicine profile at the School of Healthcare and Welfare at Mallard, Mallardland University in Sweden. Um, she was dean of the faculty there, where she was responsible for quality development and assurance of all education research at the university. She is the leader of a multidisciplinary research group, Be Me Health. Her research includes prevention, treatment, and evaluation of health problems from a behavioral medicine perspective in the physiotherapy framework. And oh, your turn.
Thank you, Janet, and thank you uh, for hosting us. And thanks to just to arrange these webinars. Uh, this is fun. I would like to say before I really start that um, here I am, you can, you can see Sweden and then Westeros Eskilstuna where my university is, two campuses and it's not so far away from Stockholm. And um, if you put next place, uh, slide please, thank you. Uh, Bain self-management strategies uh, are many of course and um, the studies of adherence and um, uh, maintenance are just focused on, on some of them. So that is uh, not that I'm covering all of them. Uh, the change is important in, uh, in our physiotherapist lives and our meeting our patients and also in research of pain. Uh, healthcare professionals are often working with changing individuals uh, health situation. Change is not easy as uh, several has uh, said already on this uh, during this webinar. It comes and it goes as you all I think you all know all participants you know that. But how can we support adherence in the maintenance of the pain self-management strategies and what is the current evidence for that? I will stress the word current evidence. Next slide please. Uh, the concept of adherence can be seen as a development of a compliance concept before oh, you know, several years ago, we all always talked about compliance, but compliance reflects from a patient's point of view that one needs to follow orders from a healthcare staff. But adherence, according to WHO, for example, their definition say that adherence can be described as a patient-centered way of communicating recommendations and letting the patient independently decide to follow a mutual agreement or, or advice. In pain management, high levels of adherence to, to for example, uh, physical activity uh, have show, shown to be highly correlated with positive outcomes. Next, please. Uh, this study is a qualitative study that uh, was about uh, finding barriers and facilitators of exercise adherence in population of uh, uh, people with persistent musculoskeletal pain. And the results showed that the, the barriers and, and facilitators are in areas of personal factors, social factors and environmental factors, but also in relationship with, uh, with the uh, physiotherapists. So we need to think of all these factors, all these areas, and it is it, this. Uh, this is going back to the first presentation today, which which was uh, with, with the, where there was uh, these small balls of uh, biopsychosocial. Keep thinking of that. Next, please. How to measure adherence uh, in studies? Um, um, they are always discussing what is good adherence, what is enough, what is good enough. And some, are, some of them are dichotomizing the adherence. They, they are putting some means uh, under the mean is not adherent, over the mean of something is uh, adherent. And some uh, studies more, more often they are using percentages. For example, that you are adherent if you are doing according to the agreement what we have, what you should do about uh, more than 80% or more or, or less than that would be no adherence. Self-reports are most commonly used and self-monitoring with, for example, an application in, in a mobile is, uh, is often used. Next, please. This is uh, quite an old, old study by Lorimer Mosley, but I think it is interesting about uh, training, how training diaries affect and reflect adherence to home programs. Uh, they, were, they were giving, uh, either the patients uh, did have the training diary or did not. And the patients also were monitored by uh, some computerized monitoring system. And some of them, knew that they were monitored and some of them did not know, know that they were monitored. But those who had, the results was that those who had training diary and they knew they were monitored by a computer, they have a highest adherence and they reported highest accuracy also between the training diary and the computer monitoring compared to those who didn't know they, they were monitored. <clears throat> so using 
using yourself, for example, as a clinical physiotherapist to, to somehow monitor patients' uh, adherence uh, to the instructions uh, you have agreed to uh, and giving the patient um, a training diary, for example, uh, would be the good way to, to increase adherence. Next, please. Behavior change techniques, they are, uh, I, need to, I need you to be um, aware of that the initial be behavior change techniques are not necessarily working for adherence or maintenance of behavior. So there are differences what to use uh, as um, increasing adherence or, or maiden maintenance. This is a systematic uh, review where uh, behavior change techniques, PCTs, were applied in interventions uh, of, uh, they got gathered uh, 22 studies and compared to interventions with no intervention, placebo, minimal intervention or usual care. And the follow-up was at least um, uh, three months. The common BCTs uh, in these studies were graded tasks, goal setting, self-monitoring of behavior and uh, problem solving and also feedback. They saw, showed that uh, there was moderate quality evidence uh, to use um, PTCs, PCTs uh, um, to enhance uh, medium term um, adherence that is three to six months, up to three to six months follow up. But the long term adherence was not uh, shown to be effective. They also saw that um, using several PCTs, more than eight different kind of PCTs, resulted better adherence. Next, please. So maintenance. Maintenance of a, of a behavior, it is a sustainability of a behavior. We, we want to, something to, to, to stay which is not so easy, task, uh, at least when we are talking about um, uh, physical activity. There is no consensus of definition what, when you have reached the main maintenance, when you are maintaining, what, what, what is the cutoff when you are maintaining the behavior? There is no consensus definition of this. Uh, but um, theoretical model of behavior change, um, trans -theoretical, theoretical model of behavior change, uh, describe maintenance that it is something where lifestyle changes have been made and the person is working to prevent uh, relapse prevention, prevent uh, relapse. Sorry about double words here. It is not clear what conditions are needed to, to maintain a new behavior and prevent relapse or how to re-establish the new behavior after a relapse. So there is no consensus uh, about these conditions needed. But the maintenance seems to depend on motivation, self-regulation, habits, resources, environment and, and social influences. This figure is from, uh, from a quite recent study where, where it is shown when behavior change is initiated and the period A here is, I don't need, know if you see my pointer, but there is a period A where the the black, black line is, uh, <clears throat> is the new behavior and the gray is the old behavior. When the new behavior is uh, being dominant response in different contexts. And after a while, um, mostly it happens that uh, the old behavior, for example, if you, we are talking here new behavior, bending your, uh, bending your low back in different tasks if the person has been avoiding at least a li little bit more heavier tasks uh, and bent um, his or her neck, uh, low back pain, low back. So the um, old behavior comes up again, uh, be being more dominant in different contexts. And it means often that there is a lapse, the, the person is um, going away from the new behavior. But hopefully when the new behavior is getting um, generalized ear, ear, across many contexts, then it would be maintain, maintained. Then, we, then we, you would reach the maintenance. So generalizing contexts where to use the new behavior is the way to the maintenance. Next, please. 
this systematic review was about maintenance, uh, both physical activity and dietary, dietary interventions. And they, they defined um, in studies that uh, it would be uh, behavior would be maintained if, it, if there was a, uh, more than three months and significant changes in all outcomes. But in clinical practice, more normally we are talking about maybe year, one year or years with a certain behavior. It takes time to, to um, change the course. Next, please. This is the, the results of that uh, systematic review. And they showed that the longer intervention was better. That, that was uh, more than interventions that were more than uh, 24 weeks. Thinking about clinical practice, how long intervention time or treatment time we have. Uh, just a little point there. Partly, they sh should be partly face-to-face, -face, these interventions that would be uh, increasing maintenance behavior of behavior. Use of multiple behavior change techniques, more than six uh, was uh, shown to be um, positive. And the most used behavior change techniques in, in the, these studies were the uh, instruction of how to change behavior. And the instruction here includes what happens when the behavior is uh, getting towards maintenance uh, and what to do, instruction what to do include booster sessions, um, follow-ups as a re for reinforcement for the, for the patients. Identify barriers for maintenance is positive and opportunities for social comp comparison, how the other patients are, are, uh, are doing, how are, they, how, they are, how are they keeping their behavior. In other studies, self-monitoring has shown both being positive and negative or neutral. Uh, Self-efficacy, um, Believing in one's uh, capability in maintaining your behavior is a positive uh, thing here in maintenance. And social norms, what, the con what is the context and what is the behavior in that context? How, how supported it, is it in, by, by the social norms when one, where one is living? And the satisfaction with the change, the patient's uh, own satisfaction with the change. Next, please. Just uh, shortly, I wanted to show this, this uh, physical activity maintenance theory figure. And they are, see, here you see all these different factors, all the different concepts that most prob probably uh, influence the physical activity maintenance. Life stress, goal setting, motivation, self-efficacy, different things, physical ac activity environment. All these are most probably uh, influencing uh, physical activity maintenance. This is a theory, so this is not proven um, or tested in all, the, all of its associations, but I want you to know that there are so many different things to, uh, to um, affect in maintenance. Next, please. This is my summary of uh, what to do. Techniques supporting behavior change for adherence and maintenance in pain self-management. So systematically using for adherence, um, what the studies say today, uh, are goal setting or and re-evaluation re of, of goals, self-monitoring of behavior and outcomes, graded tasks, problem solving, feedback on one, one's uh, behavior and outcome to reinforce self-efficacy, using multiple uh, PCTs, results better adherence. And regarding maintenance, you should include a booster session as a reinforcement opportunity, have a, uh, give opportunities for social comparison, self-efficacy for maintaining new behavior, self-monitoring plus, minus, minus, I don't know really, we don't know really, identify barriers for maintenance and multiple BCTs results better maintenance. And next please. Next, please. That is my university. Thank you so much for listening.
Okay, thank you everyone for attending. It looks like we've gone a little bit over the time, um, but we will try and get these answers to your questions that you have asked in the Q&A box or the chat um, to you by email. And if you all have any other questions, please type them now so that we can make sure to get, try and get you an answer. Um, we have other webinars coming up. Um, one that might be a particular interest to this group is on prevention of pain after musculoskeletal trauma, which is in early August. Um, and you will receive information about a link to the recording um, in an email follow-up, as well as um, there will be information posted on our website um, about some of the resources that the presenters have mentioned here, since there were some questions about those. Um, if you do have any other questions, uh, you can email me at globalyear at iasp-pain.org. Thank you all for attending, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.